A 43-year-old Indian man named Madhu has paid all the money he has in the world to travel to Qatar to help build fancy stadiums for the 2022 World Cup. It means early starts, late finishes, grueling labor, and then one day just like that, he's dead. His death certificate says natural causes. His family in India, already desperately short of money, are told the nature of his death means no compensation. That seems very harsh indeed, and perhaps a bit of a lie. Does Madhu's story belong to one of the biggest scandals in sporting history? We'll get to that soon, but let's start this story from the beginning. As some of you might know, hosting the World Cup can be a massive money spinner for your country. It costs billions to host it, but countries hope they'll do very well on their investment. It's a risk, but one that usually pays off. Stadiums need to be built, new roads must go up, and transport systems have to be created. Qatar has built over 100 hotels as well as a new airport. None of this has come cheap, with reports saying the country has spent a whopping $220 billion on this World Cup. This amount is unheard of. Russia, which hosted the 2018 World Cup, may have spent about $11.8 billion, but it's possible the event added around $14 billion to Russia's economy. In short, hosting the World Cup can be a very beneficial venture, but it's also a very big risk. It could potentially almost bankrupt a nation, so it's not surprising a country might cut a few corners. It seems Qatar has cut more corners than the Formula One drivers that grace the tracks at the Qatar Grand Prix. We'll explain what we mean by that soon. Billions of people watch the games on TV. All of those eyes are supposed to see how great the host nation is. That means it's good for the tourism business. Over 5 million tourists visited Russia over the course of the competition. It's thought between them they spent in the region of $1.5 billion. This is partly why countries bid to host the event, an event bigger than anything of its kind on the planet. It's also why countries have paid bribes in the past to get FIFA officials to vote for them. Allegedly, that's how South Africa managed to host the competition in 2010. Did Qatar do the same? Some people think it did. Although investigations have so far ruled out any financial skullduggery on Qatar's part, here's what The Guardian said about this. There's no chain of evidence linking Qatar itself to any kind of corruption in securing its World Cup bid success. Qatar's Supreme Delivery Committee has always strongly denied any such involvement, and rightly so. A two-year inquiry by FIFA's Ethics Committee found no significant concerns. The U.S. Department of Justice seems to think differently. Its agents talked about FIFA and Qatar corruption in April 2022, but if there's any kind of mud on Qatar related to bribery, it hasn't stuck. Yet. Still, FIFA has indulged in a fair amount of corrupt behavior in the past. Sources of its officials have recently been charged and found guilty of taking bribes to secure a country's right to host the event and in matters concerning TV rights. With about 3.5 billion folks turning in to watch Russia's World Cup, those TV rights are hot property, maybe the hottest property in TV. An investigation recently found that one FIFA official had been bribed to help Fox win the English language rights to show the 2018 and 2022 World Cups. This kind of thing, it seems, is par for the course for the FIFA cartel. I mean, association. It might be referred to as the beautiful game, but football, especially the World Cup, is plagued with corruption. There's just too much money involved. But that doesn't necessarily mean Qatar will be a bad World Cup, which is the argument we're making in this show today. It's related, though, as you'll see soon. The US might be harboring some sour grapes as it also bid to host the 2022 World Cup. It's not easy winning the right to host the event. England, the true home of football, lost out in its effort to host the tournament in 2018. England has only hosted once in 1966 when it won the entire competition. France has only hosted it once, as has Spain. Belgium and the Netherlands also lost out in 2018, along with Spain and Portugal. These are all great football nations. That's something you need to keep in mind for the purpose of the show we're making today. For the 2022 World Cup, Australia, Indonesia, Japan, Mexico, Qatar, South Korea, and the United States all bid, and in 2010 when the votes were cast, Qatar came out the winner. You could argue that the US should not have won, seeing it hosted the event in 1994, Japan and South Korea hosted it in 2002, so you think they too wouldn't get in again so fast, Australia and Indonesia have never hosted it, although Indonesia's effort was disqualified because of insufficient government support, and Mexico withdrew its bid due to financial reasons. It was still a surprise that Qatar won, for the reasons we'll talk about soon. It should be said here that 24 FIFA officials should have cast votes, but two of them did not vote in the 2022 determination because they'd been accused of selling votes. FIFA didn't find this out itself, it took a British newspaper's investigation to get to the bottom of it. It should also be said that the others who cast a vote were far from squeaky clean. Australia was eliminated in the first round of voting, 
Japan lost the second round and South Korea lost the next round. It went down to the wire between Qatar and the US and Qatar won by a margin of 14 to 8. There were a lot of unhappy people in America. The US had a right to feel peeved some years later when 11 of the 22 committee members that voted in the 2018 and 2022 World Cup bids were either fined, suspended, kicked out of FIFA for life, or prosecuted for corruption. Still, Qatar won and no one as of yet has been able to find anyone guilty of taking bribes. On the upside, people said it was about time an Arab nation hosted the event. The FIFA head said as much after the vote. He said the Arabic world deserves a World Cup. They have 22 countries and have not had any opportunity to organize the tournament. That's fair enough. No one has any right to say an Arabic nation should never be able to host 32 teams of millionaires to run around after a ball. After all, football is easily the most popular sport in Qatar. For years now, they've been developing football in the nation. Professionals play, amateur and expat teams play, and Qatari kids seem to love it. All-time greats have played in Qatar's leagues. Thousands of folks are die-hard fans, just as they are in Europe and South America. David Beckham, a great player in his time, just signed a deal worth about $277 million to be Qatar's face of football during the competition. If he supports you, you hit a home run. Even so, he's taken a bit of stick from people for selling his face to Qatar. Some media have said he should hang his head in shame. But why? Why should he? And why shouldn't Qatari citizens get to watch the biggest sporting event in the world in their hometowns? Here we'll give you a list of reasons, from the smallest to the biggest. One of the reasons is simply the weather. It is hot in Qatar, really hot. In fact, it's so hot that people have said those FIFA officials would have never voted for Qatar if there wasn't money in it for them. This is not just about players passing out on the field, but if temperatures climb, they just won't be able to play very well. They'll look like slugs who couldn't slither back to their patch of shade when the sun came out in the morning. Even if it's a cool day in Qatar, it could still be really hot. Although in November, the temperature will likely be anywhere from 21 degrees to 26 degrees Celsius or 69 to 79 degrees Fahrenheit. This might make playing difficult at times, especially when games go into extra time, but teams have experienced hot World Cups before. The temperature for many of the games for the Brazil World Cup of 2014 was in the high 70s and low 80s. So as far as Qatar being criticized for ridiculous heat, it's not like it hasn't ever happened before. Officials in Qatar have also said the country has built state-of-the-art air conditioning systems to help the players feel more comfortable. The smart stadiums have already been tested, and it seems like they work. So, regarding this critique, we think the naysayers don't have much of a point. A Qatari official explained, when games are not taking place, the solar installations at the stadiums will export energy to the power grid. During matches, the stadiums will draw energy from the grid. This is the basis for the stadium's carbon neutrality. He added that Qatar will later help other countries develop similar systems. That said, the World Cup being held in November and December does have a negative impact for some fans and players. It means that the leagues where most of the players play have been interrupted. Even so, FIFA has been mulling over the idea of Winter World Cups because many countries around the world have really hot summers, the traditional time to hold the event. All of this won't matter to a lot of football fans who will be traveling to Qatar. Sure, it might come a bit too close to Christmas and money might be tight, but they'll probably be happy to get some sunshine. What will bug them, though, is the lack of places where they can get blind drunk. Remember, football fans are renowned for their boozing, which in the past has unfortunately led to mostly Europeans fighting each other and smashing up local bars and restaurants. Booze isn't illegal in Qatar like in some other Muslim nations, but let's just say that drinking in the street and screaming football songs would certainly not be appreciated on a normal day in Qatar. You'll probably end up getting arrested for that. Nonetheless, not having pot-bellied men from North London screaming at opposing fans in the street, come on, let's have it, you muppets, could be a good thing. At first, it was reported that there will be boozing zones during the event, but people still wouldn't be allowed to get wasted in the streets. That might seem fair enough to some fans, even though it would dampen the fun for many others since part of their enjoyment is getting tipsy and mingling among other folks from different countries. But then, on November 18th, The Guardian wrote this headline, Qatar bans beer from World Cup stadiums after 11th hour U-turn. So, it seems the vice zones won't be there either. The Qatar affair will be way more low-key now, and this U-turn has already bugged a lot of fans. Now for another blemish on this World Cup, albeit a small one. Some fans renowned for their drinking and fighting prowess won't be there this year. They are Russian fans, since FIFA suspended Russia's right to play because of the Ukraine situation. While this might not affect the competition much at all, it's still a bad thing in general. Russia is sometimes a pretty good team, and it's not the player's fault that Putin did what he did. 
Others have argued that it seems a bit contradictory given the aggressive and sometimes criminal military actions of Saudi Arabia, the UK, the US, and other nations. The UN has stated the 2003 invasion of Iraq was a crime of a war of aggression, but we didn't see the US, the UK, Poland, and Australia being told they were banned from playing in the World Cup. Now, let's turn away from this touchy topic. All these things so far haven't elicited the brunt of criticism against Qatar's World Cup. What's really got people annoyed is the human rights or lack thereof. Saying Qatar is lacking human rights is like saying a skateboard lacks safety features. For some people, this alone should have ensured Qatar didn't get to host a World Cup. Still, some people said that about Russia, South Africa, and Argentina back in the day. Like many nations in that part of the world, Qatar is not renowned for being the beacon of human rights. On the 2021 Human Freedom Index, this country came in 128th place, which is less than great. Still, Russia was 126th, and South Africa didn't do so well either. The question is, is this enough to blacklist a country from hosting? Hold that thought for a few minutes. Qatari women might have many rights compared to women in some neighboring nations, but there's still a male guardianship law in their country. Make no mistake, Qatari women don't have the same rights as Qatari men. You won't find local women at the World Cup in the drinking zones getting wasted and chatting up European guys, that's for sure. Still, Qatar is not Afghanistan. The women of the nation will be watching the games. In an interview, the Deputy Secretary General of the World Cup Organizing Committee, Nasser al Qatar, said, In Qatar, we have no restrictions on women's access to the stadium. They've been attending matches for a long time. Even so, by law, women may well need permission from men to attend the games, and they might even have a curfew. If the women decide to breach those commandments, you can bet that there will be dire consequences for them. Such consequences are acceptable in Qatari society, or most of it anyway. So let's not try to tar everyone with the same brush. Women having to ask their men if they can go out is quite standard in some parts of the Muslim world. As an American comedian once said, there's not much fun in fundamental. So as far as any World Cup shenanigans go in the general atmosphere, we think it'll almost certainly negatively impact people's enjoyment of the tournament. And what about LGBT fans? Well, homosexuality is illegal in Qatar and could, at the very worst, be punishable by death. Obviously, that won't happen during the World Cup because Qatar has spent $220 billion and it doesn't want to look bad. It would simply just be stupid for the country to arrest a couple of snoggers. Qatari officials know some amount of leniency has to be observed. Also, fans will more than likely respect the rules of the country even if they don't agree with those rules. But it is possible in normal times that someone could be arrested for committing what Qatari cops say is a homosexual act in public. This is partly why the British have sent special cops called engagement officers over to Qatar, just to make sure no one gets mistreated. It's well known that heterosexuals are not supposed to engage in smooching when out in public in Qatar. In fact, in loads of countries in Asia and elsewhere, people think you are animals if you start necking on the train. But in Qatar, the informal rules are super strict. It's not like China, for instance, where a sneaky kiss in public will just make people think you're rude. In Qatar, it's viewed as more than a bit rude. Nonetheless, a Qatari official said the LGBT community should not worry about holding hands or kissing in public, so we guess that goes for heterosexuals too. No doubt this World Cup will see a lot of pride flags, and that too is not breaking any law unless they're draping mosques, something that might just irk the authorities. But again, there might be a feeling of oppression in the air, so we would bet if someone did try a kiss in public, gay or otherwise, they will get some funny looks from the locals. That's at least better than seven years in prison, which can happen by law. And if the lovers are Muslim, it could mean death. There are no known cases of that happening, but harassment and torture can indeed happen. This is what The Guardian wrote in 2022. Now, there are agents in the gay community that were promised safety from physical torture in exchange for working for the Preventative Security Department and helping them find groups of LGBTQ people. This wasn't related to foreign fans at the World Cup, but things are different for local folks. Maybe they think the government will let its guard down, and so they can let their hair down. They probably can't, or they shouldn't, lest they get spotted by an agent. Getting spotted by an agent at a football match usually means something completely different. A person very familiar with this matter said being gay in Qatar is like this. You live in fear. You live in the shadows. You're actively persecuted. You're subjected to state-sponsored physical and mental abuse. Even though Qatar has made assurances that foreign LGBT people won't suffer just for doing what comes naturally to them, we doubt many LGBT folks will go to the World Cup just in case, which is another reason why this World Cup might not be as good as others. Even if they're die-hard fans, they might not want to spend their money in a country where they could be persecuted by law. This can only be a bad thing for the event in general. 
Now let's talk about what we discussed at the start of the show, which is easily the biggest stain on this World Cup. Since Qatar won the bid in 2010, all those billions of dollars have been spent on building a lot of infrastructure, new roads, an airport, and public transport systems. And then there are the new hotels, lots of them, and restaurants and cafes and all kinds of things. It's taken the help of about 1.6 million migrant workers to finish the job, and many of them have not had a good time. Many migrants paid a sponsor to get there, sometimes giving them as much as $1,000, which is a lot to someone whose regular weekly wage is what many working-class Americans get in an hour. It's been reported that a lot of migrants have suffered from systematic abuse, sometimes not even being able to get their passports back if they haven't signed forms saying they've been paid when they might not have. Qatar said a while back it was trying to fix certain human rights issues, but it seems it didn't happen enough for some media and organizations. Working conditions there were said to have been awful for many people, with The Guardian writing in 2013 that many workers were forced to work without pay. There's a term for that, slavery. These workers sometimes stayed in rat-infested rooms, although if we're honest, migrant workers all over parts of Asia usually live in temporary shacks close to their construction sites. Still, this is Qatar, a country with tons of cash, one that spent $220 billion and it should have done better by its workers. When a crew from the BBC went over to investigate where these people were staying, they were interrogated by security services and spent two days in jail. These people had even been invited to investigate by the Qatari's prime minister's office, although as it so happens, it seems the BBC guys went to places they weren't allowed to go. This is reminiscent of when journalists are allowed in prisons, except they only get to see the parts of the prison that are done up and told the prisoners to look happy. It's the Potemkin village approach to allowing journalists tours, an approach very popular in North Korea. Still, we have to be fair and tell you what a Qatari official said. The problems that the BBC reporter and his crew experienced could have been avoided if they had chosen to join the other journalists on the press tour. They would have been able to visit, in broad daylight, the very camps they tried to break into at night. It doesn't mean that things were okay, far from it. In 2021, The Guardian wrote that 6,500 migrant workers from India, Pakistan, Nepal, Bangladesh, and Sri Lanka had died since Qatar started its construction projects in 2010. That's an average of 12 bodies a week. Sure, construction can be a dangerous job, but it shouldn't be that dangerous. The death toll is expected to be much higher too, since the data for some nations hasn't been seen yet, including data from the Philippines and Kenya. Also, not many deaths have been classed as work-related deaths linked to the construction of those stadiums. The families waiting for what is usually the man of the house to return home have often just been informed that the death was not work-related. Many deaths are just reported as natural deaths, which makes it almost impossible for the family to get any compensation. This is really bad when you consider that they rely on this breadwinner to survive. Women are left with kids to feed in places where it's impossibly hard for them to gain decent employment. Still, not all deaths have been reported as being from natural causes. The Guardian wrote, Qatar's grim death toll is revealed in long spreadsheets of official data listing the causes of death. Multiple blunt injuries due to a fall from height, asphyxia due to hanging, undetermined cause of death due to decomposition. 69% of deaths consisting of Bangladeshi, Indian, or Nepali workers were reported as natural. For Indians, natural causes were reported 80% of the time. How did so many healthy men just die all of a sudden? Hmm, does that seem strange to you? It should, but we'll never know the truth because most of the time there wasn't an autopsy. As you know, when young folks with no serious health issues just drop down dead, there's usually an autopsy. Not in Qatar, it seems, at least if you're poor and have a foreign passport. The government has so far usually plugged its ears when people have asked for an investigation. The deaths were very likely not natural at all, and the families of the deceased deserve some compensation. Sure, as the saying goes, no amount of money will bring them back, but trust us, in parts of the developing world that bit of compensation could be a life or death matter for the family members. So when fans cheer on their teams, they might be mindful that blood was spilled so they could have a little bit of fun. The Qatari government has said things such as, every lost life is a tragedy and no effort is spared in trying to prevent every death in our country. We're not so sure we at the Infographics show buy into that. We've seen some nasty videos. We've also seen first-hand construction sites in India, Nepal, Thailand, Myanmar, Laos, Vietnam, and Malaysia. And to be honest, health and safety doesn't look like the paramount concern in those places. Still, Qatar is the diamond in an ocean of sand. It is loaded. Doha is a glittering city, a place wherever you look, you're reminded of money, 
The glitzy airport is festooned with gold shops and, man, is the food expensive. What we're trying to say is Qatar could have done much better. It won the bid to host this competition and so it should have acted like a wealthy nation and taken care of its migrant workers rather than obfuscate the truth and outright lie at times. Maybe some of you more hardline folks are now thinking, the infographic show's creative team needs to man up and quit that bleeding heart routine. Maybe some of you think 200 bucks a month is the standard for migrant workers and life is just always going to be hard for some people. You might also be okay with workers having their passports taken and their wages held back for months, or that it's okay that some workers are thrown out of the country for just complaining about it. Maybe none of these human rights violations will make a dent in your enjoying the games, but polls suggest you are the minority. Most people are bothered. Sure, some of our team will watch the games. They won't think too much about a young man being electrocuted by wayfaring wires as he navigated his construction site dwelling, but when this is all over, when the men in suits count their piles of gold coins, we'll remember the true cost of playing this beautiful game. Now you need to watch what happens to your body when you start exercising, or have a look at Death Row All-Stars, prisoners playing a game for their lives.